Use, um, use call it. There's a there's a, a guy who's just uh, man, managing this this Zoom uh, from Mexico City. So he since I don't know very well how to manage all this stuff, but he's helping me in in in, in just broadcasting this on Facebook and YouTube. We all need a studio for all of this. <laughs> this is the new normal, right, Danny? <laughs> uh, I can tell everybody's lighting is different. Background, <laughs> we don't have to use those filters on our camera, right? We just change the lighting. <laughs> and I didn't even put no makeup on. God almighty. <laughs> You're a brave soul. They usually, they usually powder my face <laughs> for obvious reasons. Leave it alone, please. The God. <laughs> <it all. laughs> Hey, Glenn, I thought you were on earlier and I said happy birthday I, and it turns out you were there. I, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, happy you birthday, did. Glenn. I don't think I'm any wiser. I'm older, but I don't think I'm any wiser. When's your birthday, Glenn? Uh, April 20th. April oh, my 20th. daughter's okay. birthday. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Nice, usually a nice time of year. Okay. So, so I'll just shake this out. You're not on furlough, are you, Daniel? I was last week, actually. Yeah. Oh, this okay. week, but last week. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was we, just kidding. Oh well. <laughs> no, we have. I understand uh, to give you. Yeah. Well, all of us have to take um, one week furlough every month through the sec, at least through the second quarter. Wow. It reminds me of the story of the shopkeeper who said to both of his employees, "Business is not good, so don't be surprised <laughs> if I have to, you know, get rid of one of you sooner or later," and then they. The workers got together and came back the next day. He says, "What if we just split one salary?" Because they didn't know which one was going to go. You know. <laughs> That's what those alternating furloughs remind me of. <laughs> Splitting yeah. salaries. Yeah, but it's it, essentially yeah. Okay, okay, guys, we we're, we're starting now. Thank you. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. I mean, as you know, my name is Jorge Mendoza Yescas, Consul General of Mexico in, in Phoenix, and I'm honored, I'm honored to for the opportunity to of hosting this um, webinar to analyze the impact of SB 1070 in its uh, 10th anniversary. So, for this exercise, I'm joined by by a select group of actors who played a key role 10 years ago during the months that that led to the proclamation of ESB 1070. In the months and years that follows uh, the fall, uh, such, such actors are still today some of the most recognized voices representing different sectors of our community. So please uh, join me in welcoming, and I'm going to read a little, little bit about, uh, about their background. Uh, first, I, I would like to introduce State Representative Charlene Fernandez. Uh, she's the mi minority leader at the Arizona House of Representatives. Um, 
Minority Leader Fernandez has been a member of the Arizona House of Representatives since uh, 2015. She worked with Congressman Ed Pastor and served Governor Janena Napolitano at the Arizona De Department of Environmental Quality. So prior to the enact en enactment of SB 1070, she was vice chair of the Arizona Democratic Party and witness of the debate uh, that was generated around uh, the SB, SB 1070. Also, I'm, I'm very, very happy to introduce Mr. Glenn Hammer, president and CEO of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. In 2010, as president of the chamber, uh, Mr. Hammer was one of the most outstanding representatives of the business community during the debate over SB 1070. Also, I have the honor to introduce uh, Petra Falcon. Uh, she's the president of Promise Arizona. As president of Promise Arizona in 2010, uh, Petra Falcon played a leading role among, among the pro immigrant organizations that, among other activities, uh, mobilized, mobilized the community, organizing vigils in front of the Capitol and other civil resistance activities during the debate of SB 1070. Uh, I would like also to introduce uh, Mr. Daniel Gonzalez. Uh, he's an immigration reporter at the Arizona Republic. Uh, Daniel Gonzalez has worked for the, for the Arizona Republic for more than 20 years. In 2018, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Explanatory Reporting as co-lead reporter of the World Series. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez was uh, on the front lines during the debate over the SB 1070. And uh, well, also we we have uh, as, as our panelist um, attorney Daniel Ortega from Ortega Law Firm. He's a legal advisor for the council uh, for for many years. Uh, in 2010, uh, Daniel Ortega was a chair of the board of directors of the National Council of La Raza, now Unidos U.S. And and he's one of the most respected leaders of the civil rights groups. And thank you, thank you for joining us. And well, this um, this webinar is just uh, we have we would like to have some talk about and reflect about our, our what was what was at that time and you know, what was happening, and not just what the effects of the law have been, but also the consequences and the effects that it has in the social and the political, and in the and the um, in the economic in the economic uh, uh, aspects. Uh, so thank you, thank you for for being here. I would like first of all to making this, uh, this Mr. Um, I, I would I would like uh, Mr. Daniel Ortega first uh, if you can uh, tell us or share with us your pers your perspective or or your opinion about those years that precede the enactment of the of the SB 1070 and your legal opinion about the uh, legal challenges on the uh, constitution constitutionality of the law. So, well, uh, thank you, first of all, for uh, inviting me uh, to join you this morning, uh, particularly with the panel that's before us. Uh, I'm honored to be a part of it. Uh, I think it's important to understand that SB 1070 didn't happen uh, necessarily in 2010. Uh, SB 1070 started happening in the late uh, 1900s. We're, we're talking in particular uh, the avid supporters of the English only state and or legislation. Uh, it has its genesis right in that era. Uh, and it has its genesis too, and I'm sure Glenn can talk about, about the economics uh, uh, of immigrants into Arizona and the reaction that people were having, particularly back in the early 2000s, uh, where the Spanish language became more predominant. Uh, and so the genesis uh, uh, of, of SB 1070 really started back then. Then the next step that we saw was Prop 200. Uh, so between the beginning of 2000 and about 2004, this continued anti-immigrant sentiment began to grow and grow. Uh, uh, Prop 200 had two areas in particular. Uh, one was with what I consider, and in my own words, uh, 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 an effort by the legislature back then to uh, get involved in voter suppression, uh, but they couldn't do it because Janet Napolitano and uh, uh, 
uh, if I remember correctly, was there and that was not going to get her signature. And so they decided to put it on the ballot and uh, Prop 200, unfortunately, was the first anti-immigrant legislation that we had uh, that dealt with the government's role, state government's role in uh, assisting the immigration service in the apprehension and detention of immigrants who applied for benefits or who they believe uh, were in the country un undocumented if they applied for any benefits. Uh, we lost uh, 56 to 44. Uh, it was fairly close, uh, but then you saw the energy of those who were um, wanting to enact more state legislation uh, against immigrants grow. Uh, they saw an opportunity, and unfortunately, that opportunity led to, you know, uh, uh, out-of-state tuition for uh, immigrant children uh, who wanted to attend the universities, it, uh, uh, inability to get bond if you were undocumented and were accused of committing a crime, um, a, a whole host of things. And unfortunately, a lot of those were referred to the, to the voters for the same reason. They weren't going to get by the governor's office and, and the voters overwhelmingly, I mean, 80, 20 uh, voted in favor uh, of, of those initiatives. And so as more initiatives, as more support for these kinds of uh, laws grew, um, then they took the bold step of uh, proposing SB 1070. And clearly at that point, Janet McCulloch left to become uh, to go work for the president and Jan Brewer, uh, who was then Secretary of State, became the governor and used it um, as a prime element of her campaign. At that point, Terry Goddard was ahead by 16 points uh, in the polls and uh, at the point at which uh, uh, then Governor Brewer signed SB 1070, uh, she immediately took the lead and ultimately became uh, the governor. So. Uh, we have that history uh, in totality, and, and all the faces were there, uh, Russell Pierce, uh, Joe Arpaio, et cetera, et cetera. I had, of course, a, a very interesting role in all of this. Uh, uh, throughout all these campaigns, uh, you both had to be uh, an activist, uh, uh, and in my role, a lawyer, and was uh, involved in both areas. As it relates to SB 1070, I had the uh, privilege of serving as one of the co-counsel, uh, uh, particularly with MALDIF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, and challenging SB 1070, along with the ACLU of Arizona and a host of, remember there were 25 firms uh, that were challenging SB 1070, which was a really, uh, I mean, the state had all the, the, the resources uh, to defend itself. And so you had to have an equal amount of resources on the other side uh, to challenge it. Now, I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, SB 1070 was gutted uh, and uh, in large part was defeated because it criminalized status, uh, which uh, you could not do uh, under the Constitution of the United States. Uh, that was the purview of the federal government and not the purview of the state. But the only thing that remained in place uh, was the show me your papers provision of SB 1070, which unfortunately today, uh, particularly in the city of Phoenix, uh, is being used uh, uh, to apprehend, uh, detain, arrest, and have people deported. Uh, so uh, even though I think we could claim a victory in gutting most of the criminal aspects of SB 1070, we were not successful in um, uh, the, the, the challenge against the show me your uh, papers provision of it, which I think today has a, a very uh, great impact on our community. Uh, let me just uh, uh, finish by saying that uh, SB 1070, in my opinion, and in our lifetime, uh, will be challenged again. And I believe we will be successful, particularly with the statistics that we're beginning to see, not only in the city of Phoenix, but throughout the state, of how it's being used, okay, for racial profiling and ultimate apprehension and deportation of our community. And when I talk about our community, I'm talking about Latinos in general, not the undocumented, but our community, because it's based upon factors that legally you cannot enforce uh, uh, without, you know, the color of skin or the accent or the, the different things that police officers use to 
have suspicion over whether somebody's here undocumented. You should know, and I'll end, that SB 1070, uh, for the most part, has been unsuccessful in its suspicion aspect because a majority of those who are detained for ICE, okay, uh, who are Latino, are, 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 not, are not arrested or detained. Uh, they're able to go on their own way when it's determined that they're not here undocumented. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Thank you very much. Uh, State Representative Fernandez, uh, you know, uh, as, as, you know SB, SB 1070 was considered the, the peak of the, of, the, of the attrition to enforcement doctrine. So it became one, one of the oldest uh, anti, uh, in a strict anti illegal immigration uh, mission that was, uh, was passed in the United States, States at, at that time. So, if you can tell us, uh, according to your experience in, in the years that lead to SB 1070, in, in your perspective as a legislator, laws related to, to immigration enforcement. Thank you so much for. Um, convenient. I just learned so much more just listening to Danny. So, I mean, and this is an elite group, so I look forward to hearing what all of you have to say. Um, thank you again. Um, I was quite fortunate that I was also in a position as a school board member at that time. So I saw what happened to our, our schools, and, and I was in a rural area here in Yuma County, and we had parents that were keeping their kids home because of the fear that SP, SB 1070 brought to every community in Arizona. And it didn't matter if you were here documented or undocumented, but there was a sense of fear. It was a reign of terror for our community. And what was important was that many of us, um, all of us stood together. Um, uh, like I said, I, I was a school board member. I was also, um, um, involved with the Democratic Party here locally and and statewide um, and and I was it was at a, at a time when I was just coming off the hills of working for uh, the governor um, this this was a, a very very racist bill that not only hurt our community like it is today with COVID-19 hurting us economically it, it, it was in that same manner um, I think about, I, I always try to put a positive spin on things that happen, but if you remember in, in uh, 2010, there was only 13 Latinos serving us at the Arizona State Legislature. Only 13. Today, there's 23 of us standing strong, and there will be more. And this is one of the silver linings of SB 1070, because people band together. Um, I, I wonder and shudder and think about what was in the minds of our politicians that we would let something like this happen. And Danny is correct. It just didn't happen the day that Governor Brewer signed that bill. It was many, many, many years in the making. And what it did was it taught us that we have to fight these things every single day every inequity that is happening to our community, that is happening in our schools, where some schools are funded better than others because of the makeup of the school, the demographics of the school. Um, we have to be ever vigilant and make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. Economically, it took a long time for us to bounce back. I think that uh, in many of our communities, uh, like I said, I live in Yuma County. I go all the way to the international border with San Luis and Somerton as uh, our largest uh, Latino communities in this area. And they lost a lot of people that um, just decided to go back uh, to, to areas where they, they came from, where they, ha they had already raised their kids here and brought their kids here. And we had educated those kids. This is the problem. We have to think, we have to be forward thinkers. If we are educating children, no matter what they look like, no matter who they belong to, no matter what their documentation looks like, if we are educating them from kindergarten to eighth grade, from eighth grade to high school, we cannot put up barriers to keep them from going to college. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we have learned from that time. Hopefully we are better. And I think a, a forum like this that you've brought together will remind us that we don't ever want to go down that path again. 
Um, you know, that's, that's about all I have to say. This is, like I said, a very, very important forum for all of us to listen to. I'm so um, glad that we're commemorating this day because we should always remember, never forget, because if we do, there's a chance that we'll do this again. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Glenn, just, uh, I'm going to ask you about, uh, about your sure. experience. Your, you know, it, the economic uh, fallout uh, of SB 1070 made the, the business community one of the uh, most important spheres in during the, the months and years that follow the, the enactment of, the, of this law. So you you became a, a leading voice in, of the business community. Uh, so what 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 can you tell us about the impact that SB 1070 uh, has or has had in the in the economy in the state's economy? Well, I'm I'm glad to say as we look at the economy now, and unfortunately we have to go back a little bit, you know, before COVID 19. Uh, you know, just a month ago, about you know. During our spring training season, we had our strongest economy in our state's history, and, and a big reason of that uh, was our relationship with Mexico, our friend, ally, and neighbor. And it was well beyond uh, some of the traditional areas. I mean, you take a look on the agricultural side, you take a look on the tourism side. I mean, far and away, our number one source of international visitors are friends from Mexico. Uh, normal time, seven and a half million dollars a day in our hotels, resorts, and, and shops. And then you look at uh, what was happening in manufacturing, uh, where we were building things together in large part because of the supply change in, uh, in, in Sonora, uh, the electric car industry. Uh, you know, you had the extraordinary situation of the governor from Sonora and, and Governor Ducey joining together to talk about uh, the, uh, the Lucid plant, uh, that's, that's, that's in Pinal County. And a big part of that was our relationship with Mexico. Look, I, uh, Mr. Ortego outlined that this was 1070 did not happen in a vacuum. It was certainly the peak. Uh, after that point, I would, ref I would uh, constantly say that 1070 was the peak of all of that activity. And eventually the Supreme Court put very significant guardrails on what the state could do. But what I wanted to say, Mr. Mr. Consul General, since I've been at the chamber for a long time, uh, 13 years, you know, our position has been pretty simple. We want to trade more with our friend Ally, ally and, and neighbor Mexico, and we want to have easier flows of immigration uh, going, go, going both, both, both ways. Uh, I mean, you take a look at, for example, the NAFTA visas. Uh, we have over 60 classifications of workers. And, and you know something? A lot of those workers, what are the fields that they're in right now? Medical fields. They're literally nurses, doctors. During this critical time, a number of these individuals are in Arizona. So what we learned uh, from that experience is this is a, the truth is the DNA of the state, we're a welcoming state. And whether it was on immigration or other types of issues, we wanted to make sure from that point forward that our legislation reflected our values. And I, I believe if, if you take a look 10 years back, uh, we have had a very good track record of making sure that those types of uh, initiatives uh, don't go forward. So you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that 10 years passed where we were before COVID-19 was at a very good spot. There's a bipartisan consensus to be productive. I don't believe our relationship with Mexico, uh, with Governor Ducey and Pavlovich, as well as I think he was one of two sitting governors at the time to visit Mexico City. I was part of that delegation for the inauguration of uh, President Lopez Obrador. I believe that right now we're at the highest point. We want to keep it that way and we want to build on it. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, Ms. Ms. Petra Falcon, um, uh, just we we'll, we'll go on with, with you. Um, the grassroots grassroots organizations played an essential 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 role in 2010. So thousands of people came together.
from different groups. So in, in order to, to protest the enactment of, of this law. So what, uh, what, what can you tell us about the role of the grassroots organizations during the debate uh, in, uh, of, the, of the SB 1070? Muy buenos días a todos, and thank you again, Consul uh, um, Melissa, for inviting us. I'm really pleased to be a part of this uh, elite group, as Charlene called it. <laughs> but um, but I, I guess we've all been thinking a lot about SB 1070s this year because it's the 10th anniversary. It's not a celebration, but it is a moment in, in our history, uh, in, in our story, in the narrative of the state that really gave it a stain, not only in Arizona, but across the country. And I'll just add a couple of more uh, facts to, um, to Danny's uh, context about what led up to SB 1070 since, since the late, since the early 2000s. Um, in 2006, all across the country, we were having major, major marches. And there were lots of Latinos, immigrant people of color out in the streets pushing for comprehensive immigration reform. And in, and in Phoenix, um, there was a coalition of organizations that organized a major march, and there was a half, almost a half a million people out in the streets here in Phoenix. And I do think that triggered something in the state that, oh my goodness, what's happening to our state? Where are we going with all of these, all of these immigrants in our in our neighborhoods? And I think that was a, must have been a flag because it just seemed that right, right after that, the intensity of the attacks on immigrants was, was even greater. Uh, and of course, we were already fighting. We were already fighting at the national level, and I had been, I had spent a decade at the national level fighting for comprehensive immigration reform and working on the border. And then SB 1070 happened in 2010. Um, and I, I do, I do, I, I do want to acknowledge that the movement wasn't just in the grassroots movement. It was also in education. It was a spiritual movement. There was a humane movement. There was a business movement. And of course, the community-based movement that that triggered uh, that triggered a lot for us in the community was something very, very personal because because we think I think that the message behind SB 1070 that uh, that Latinos and immigrants were going to be a threat not only to our nation but to our state, and so there that that and that hate and because I used to think that SB 1070 divided our state, it didn't. We were no longer together. We had been working, I think trying to work across the aisle, but SB 1070 just divided us and it, and it for political reasons as well. Um, but the outcome of all of that, I think uh, there was a lot of positive energy in the community, a lot of energy among young people, um, but the, the damage that it did uh, is still is with us because um, it was so personal that, that anyone, anybody of color which could be tapped on their shoulder and they could be asked for their papers, whether you were going to go vote, whether you were in the park, whether you were going, you know, you were, you were going to, to, to just to your, you were walking in your neighborhood and you could get picked up at any time. So it was very, very personal. And uh, I think it also hit all generations. It wasn't just, uh, you know, the young people or, or the activists. It hit children, it hit children because I heard that uh, recently somebody told me that kids in the third and fourth grade started to wear a colored ribbon around their arms when they went to school because they were afraid that they were going to be targeted for immigrant for, for deportation. So, so you keep you keep hearing how it impacted all generations, not just the young people that were active in the movement. Uh, seniors, senior veteran seniors were saying how how ugly is our community becoming and why why is this happening in our country? We we were veterans. We we fought in the war. We defended our country, and here we are being tagged as as immigrants and people that need to be deported and we're taking jobs away from people. So it became really, really ugly at the, at the grassroots level. And I do think the, the, the youth involved uh, were triggered because they're, they're, they, they saw, saw for the first time their parents getting involved actively and it was the parents that were at the Capitol every day fighting SB 1070. And, and I just thought that that triggered a lot, a lot more energy because you saw young people standing up with their parents against SB 1070. And I, and I, just, and I just think that that will continue to stay with us. Um, but yes, as, as Charlene was saying, the silver lining is that we now have more people of color and in the legislature, but also on school boards all across the state. I mean, we have lots more participation and that's a good thing. That's a very, very, very good thing. Uh, but I also think about what are the solutions? Well, what do we, what, how do we get to the table so that we can really craft a solution? And, and I remember being in meetings 
uh, with, with Mr. Hammer and with the editorial board of the Arizona Republic, and we were talking about immigration reform, and it was yourself, and it was Pastor Stewart, and it was uh, Ali Norani from National Immigration Forum, and we just couldn't get you to say, okay, we need immigration reform. We need something. To, what's the solution here? And I think that's where we still are. We don't have a solution. I, I think, Danny, you're right. We need to go back to SB 1070 and, and make sure that no police officer ever has the right to be able to take somebody straight over to ICE because that's still happening to this day. To this day, that is still happening. Uh, parents are being taken away from their children and, and people are going, uh, going over to Eloy and staying there for a long time. And right now, because of, of COVID, they're staying there. There's no activity that we can take to make sure that we can get parents back together. But I do think, uh, I do think in terms of a solution, I think we never have gotten to the point where we acknowledge, you know, in the state of Arizona, uh, those of us that have been here for decades and coming up from, from, from Southern Arizona and Yuma County, we need immigrant workers in the fields. And, and that's what happened the other day when nationally they were trying to say, we're going to stop people coming from the border. And the, and the growers said, hey, well, who's going to pick our, our produce? And, uh, and when I was in Yuma, I used to, I used to see 30,000 people coming across the border to come into Arizona to pick our produce and harvest all of the lettuce and the melons and, and the, the uvas and all of that. So again, we need to acknowledge that immigrants are come here and they contribute. And the solution needs to be immigrant integration where we're welcoming communities and we're receiving, but it's a two-way street. We're, we're benefiting from that labor and, and we're not acknowledging that to the point where we're making uh, immigrants uh, coexist in our community with rights, with humane rights. And, uh, and so I think that's where we need to go. We need to have some solutions because uh, I'm not seeing any just yet. So I think I'll stop there again, other than to, to acknowledge that it, it was something that was very personal for people on the ground and they lived it and uh, we're continuing to live it. Thank you very much, Petra, uh, for your participation. So, uh, Daniel, Daniel Gonzalez, uh, as a reporter for the, for the Arizona Republic, uh, you, you witnessed the, uh, the uh, development of this, uh, the attrition, uh, th uh, the attrition reinforcement doctrine. So you had you had access at the time to to the main political actors in in, in 2010. So uh, if you can tell us, uh, share with us your your perspective as a reporter uh, during during those times. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate being part of this this very esteemed panel. Um, when I first came to Arizona was in, at the end of 1999. I moved here from Syracuse, New York, which was a community that was part of the Rust Belt and it was very uh, economically depressed. And I moved from an economically depressed part of the country to a part of the country that was really booming in terms of population growth and economic um, growth. And at the same time, um, we were experiencing one of the largest migrations that the world had ever seen. So for as a reporter, it was a fascinating time to, to be here in Arizona. So I wanted to talk a little bit kind of about some of the over, broad, in broad strokes, some of the big things that were happening here in Arizona that led up to SB 1070. And then also talk a little bit about some of our findings that we've, we've been publishing over the last several months as part of our 10th anniversary series into um, the anniversary of SB 1070, and also some of those political actors that you're that you're referring to, um, the role that they played. Um, but in, in 1999 and 2000, when I came here, it was when we were really seeing a lot of people coming across the border from Mexico. And there were some big reasons for that, why that was happening. And one of the big reasons was that the United States was experiencing one of the biggest economic booms that it had ever seen. And at the same time, leading up to that, in the mid-1990s, Mexico had experienced some economic difficulties that was making it difficult for people to find jobs in Mexico. And also, um, there were a lot of people in Mexico that were entering the workforce um, that weren't able to find jobs. So we had two kind of big push-pull factors. People were being pushed out of Mexico and people were being pulled to the United States for jobs. Um, the other thing that was happening is that Arizona itself was, was uh, benefiting from these economic booms. And at the time, uh, Phoenix and Maricopa County were, were one of the fastest growing 
um, metropolitan areas in the United States. So there was this, and one of the big things that was driving that was the construction industry. There was just this tremendous uh, construction boom going on here in, in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And also as people had a lot of um, uh, were uh, becoming uh, more and more affluent in the United States as they were coming to Arizona to enjoy our weather. They were retiring here. The resorts were booming and all that led to a tremendous need for workers in our state. Um, and so um, people start, were, a lot of people were coming across the border, but because there was no mechanism, no law that allowed these kinds of workers to come into the United States legally, they were forced to come into the United States illegally. And um, why were they coming through Arizona? Previously, Texas and California had been the main entry points for illegal, unauthorized immigration. But at that point, Arizona had become the main crossing point. And that was because of the fortification that took place in Texas and in California in the 1990s, which funneled people through our state um, policymakers in Washington thought well, people wouldn't come through Arizona because of their very harsh and desolate uh, landscape. It would be too dangerous and that would act as a natural barrier. But because of this tremendous push-pull factors that were going on, people were funneled through the state of Arizona. Um, and that's why we had so many people coming through our state as opposed to Texas and California. But also, so, and then as a, it's kind of a byproduct of that, because of the tremendous numbers of people wanting to come to the United States and, and all the jobs that were here, um, it led to a, a huge increase in criminal activity along the border where criminal organizations were seen, that there was a service to be provided in smuggling people across the border, and especially as more and more fortifications came into place. So those were all kind of the things that were leading up to um, SB 1070 in some states, uh, thinking about like New York and, and Illinois and California, recognized the role that immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, were playing in their state and passed laws that made to be more accommodating to them. And our, but our political leaders, um, I think in part because of our proximity to the border, chose a very different tact, and that was to only focus on the enforcements of this issue rather than the supply and demand issue. And that's why we start seeing more and more of these laws uh, coming in, uh, being passed that leading up to SB 1070's enforcement, attrition through enforcement type laws. And also many political leaders in our state, beginning with Sheriff Arpaio, recognize the political gain to be made by vilifying undocumented immigrants rather than trying to explain the larger issue that was taking place, the larger phenomenon that was taking place in our state. They chose to focus on uh, the, some of the crime that was, ancillary crime that was taking place at the border, um, some of the challenges that Arizona was experiencing. And these were major challenging challenges that the state was experiencing. But rather than focusing on solutions, they focused on, on, on it as, as a problem. And that's, and, and all because they saw the political gain that that, um, that came out of it leading up to, I mean, I mentioned Sheriff Arpaio, and then there was uh, um, uh, Senator Pierce and Andrew Thomas, the, the county attorney, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and then J um, Jan Brewer, who was in a tight race for governor leading up to in, during 2010. And then when she signed SB 1070, her, uh, her um, popularity in the poll soared and uh, she won election and she also became kind of a national uh, voice on, uh, on this uh, uh, immigration attrition through enforcement strategy. Um, so that kind of gives a little bit of the overview of, of, what, of what I covered and experienced as a journalist leading up to SP 1070. I want to just take a little moment to touch about some of the really kind of important findings that we found in our research um, and the 10th anniversary here. And I put together a, a, this very quick little PowerPoint and I can share my screen if you want or I can just kind of read from it. But um, in 2007, that was the peak of our undocumented population in the state. 500,000 people were undocumented. In 2010, when SB 1070 was signed, 
the undocumented population had dropped to 325,000. So that shows that already some factors were taking place to drive people out of the state. And that included some of those laws that were touched upon earlier, especially the E-Verify law that mandated all employers use E-Verify. And also the Great Recession was forcing people to leave the state. So that kind of raises in the question, raises the question of whether SB 1070 was a law that was even needed. Um, and then in 2017, our undocumented population had dropped all the way down to 220, 227 thousand people. Um, also now our undocumented patient population is much smaller in relationship to our overall population. In 2007, about 8% of the state's 6.3 million people was undocumented. That was about one in 12 people. In 2017, only about 3.8% of the state's 6.9 million people was undocumented. So down to about one in 25 residents. Um, also, um, Arizona's rank in, in terms of undocumented population has fallen substantially since 2010 and since the peak in 2007. In 2007, Arizona ranked second with 8% of its population undocumented. That was the second highest proportion of any state. In 2017, it had fallen to nine, nine ninth um, position. Um, also, uh, the old, um, Mexican, um, Arizona's Mexican immigrant population has also shrunk. We're talking about both documented and undocumented. Um, in 2000, from 2010 to 2018, Arizona's Mexico population grew by only 1.7%. During that same period, Arizona's overall population grew by almost 12%. So it shows that after SB 1070, our Mexican immigrant population is growing much slower. Um, I have some other stats related to the, to, to the uh, population, but I want to move on to something else that some of the other speakers have talked about that I think is very important. And that was kind of the, the, sil you know, the silver lining that you referred to, and that is how SB 1070 actually galvanized Latinos to run for office. And I, I did some digging into some of that data, and, it, and as some of the people have showed, in 2010, when SB 1070 was signed, Republicans held super majorities in both chambers of the So in the Senate, it was 18 to 12 Republicans in the House, it was 35 to 25 Republicans versus Democrats. In 2020, that gap has narrowed significantly. There are, is now 17 to 13 um, Republicans versus Democrats in the Senate, and 13, 31 to 29 uh, Republicans versus Democrats in the House. So in the Senate, Republicans have a four-person majority and in the House, they are up by only two people. So Democrats are very close to gaining a majority in the House. And that has not happened since uh, 1976 in the Senate and since 1966 in the House. Uh, the other thing that's important, um, I think people have talked about in 2010, my count, there was 14 Latinos in the legislature, six in the Senate and eight in the House. In 2020, 10 years later, there are now 23 Latinos in the legislature, seven in the Senate, and 16 in the House. And that is largely because of the, uh, uh, how SB 1070 galvanized Latinos to run for office, which raises the question of whether SB 1070 would ever pass in 2020, most likely it would not. And if it did pass, it's unlikely, I think, that our governor would sign it. Um, the other things, quick point out, the Phoenix City Council, there was only one Latino in the Phoenix City Council in 2010. In 2020, there is now four out of nine people are Latino, including Carlos Garcia, who was a major grassroots organizer during the SB 1070 period, and also Betty Guardado, who was a major union organizer, and they both sit now in the City Council. And they're just representative of many Latinos who were involved at the grassroots level 
in 2010 who are now in the elected uh, position. The other thing that I think is very important as SB 1070 contributed to is that Arizona is no longer a solid red state. Um, and we see that in, a, in, in, our, in, our, in our senators. In 2010, both of our, our um, senators were Republicans, John McCain and John Kyle, I mean, yes, and John Kyle. And then in 2018, Kristen Sinema was elected uh, to the Senate uh, to replace Jeff Flake. And that was the first time a Democrat had sat in the Senate since 1995. And it's very unlikely that Kristen Sinema would have won that seat without the support of Latina voters. Um, so anyway, those are those give you kind of a, an overview of kind of the things that led up to SB 1070 and the thing, the major changes that have taken place um, since um, SB 1070 passed 10 years ago. Well, thanks a lot for, for listening to me. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time left. Uh, maybe uh, some, so, someone may, may want to, to make a last participation as a conclusion. Maybe if you, any of you want to do it. Mr. Council General, I, 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 would, I would just say that, you know, at this point in time, we're facing the most difficult economic period, not just this country, not just what Mexico is probably facing, possibly what the world has ever faced. Uh, we've never dealt with this type of uh, situation before. And I do believe that one of the really important things that, that we could all do together is let's figure out a way uh, particularly the fact that the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, or TEMEC for our friends in Mexico, uh, is about ready to take effect. You know, what can we do along economic lines, along education lines, along cultural lines, and along immigration lines to, to build a more prosperous uh, region? Because there's a lot of people right now that are suffering on both sides of the border, and unfortunately, that's probably going to get worse. Uh, and, and, and a big part of that, and I, you know, I, I see and I appreciate the, the fine reporting of Daniel Gonzalez over the years. Those, those are extremely important statistics. And the, uh, the work of, of, of leader uh, Fernandez and, 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 and Petra, I really appreciate how you frame things on the personal side because there's a lot more than economic going on here. It's, it's treating people with, with dignity and respect. But what can we build on? And to me, the obvious area on the, on, on the Washington side is true comprehensive immigration reform that goes well beyond legalization. Oh. Glenn froze. I think froze Glenn, there. yeah, he did. I'm gonna jump in and, and I, I wanna mention that even in what we're talking about with co uh, with SB 1070, but then uh, hook it up with what's going on with COVID-19. Our immigrant community, our undocumented community is being left out. They're being left out today of, of any of the stimulus package that is coming down from Washington, D.C., yet many of the people that are undocumented are doing essential work but they're not covered under uh, any of the provisions, the executive orders, such as um, evictions from their homes, uh, from their apartments. Um, and, and this is a real issue. So we need to look at ways that we can help the undocumented community, um, that we continue this work um, and, and be better. We, and this is why we should know, uh, thank you, Daniel, both Daniels for the history and Petra, for your perspective, because it's important that we remember history or we're doomed to repeat it. And I don't want to repeat 2010 when it comes to SB 1070. You know, let me uh, say a couple of things I think that are important. And that is that, you know, whatever success we have had politically and whatever success we've had legally, because we have, uh, and of course we've had some, you know, um, disappointing results on some of the court decisions that we've had. The bottom line is that this inspired the Latino community in ways that we have never seen it. Uh, I am now at an age, uh, I started as an activist at, in high school at, at the young age of 16 years old. And I still remember being very active in the Chicano movement at a time when our activism 
uh, was, was at a high level. But I have never seen it at the level uh, that we've seen it in the last 10 years. Uh, legally, politically, organizationally, uh, the Latino community has evolved into a force that it has always talked about having, but is ultimately demonstrating it does have. And so the good thing about, uh, the, you know, we all agree that SB 1070 was bad. We all agree this anti-immigrant sentiment was bad and horrible to our community, but there is a silver lining. And that silver lining is the numbers that Daniel talked about in, in terms of the increase in elected officials and the organizing that's going on in our community. And I do have to give credit uh, to, to one organization that was key uh, in all of this uh, from the beginning, and which all of us were members of, uh, and that was Somos America. Uh, Somos America was a national organization, and then we had groups in, at the state level. In Arizona, Somos uh, was formed in, in uh, reaction to the Sensenbrenner Bill. Remember that it started in the Congress of the United States where they tried to criminalize uh, status. They, they, you know, proposing that if somebody was in the country without documents, they could be charged with a felony. Uh, and that's the, num the, the, organiza the organization of SOMOS came about as a result of the Sensenbrenner Bill and had over 100,000 people marching in the streets here in Arizona. That was also the genesis mm -hmm. of this political success that we're having today because in all of our activities, all of it, it was a matter of encouraging people to get involved politically and more importantly, to, to register to vote and to get out to vote. And so though we, we still mourn uh, uh, what's happening in this state and the relationships that we've held with this state, um, both personally and politically, uh, but we can celebrate to some degree the successes that have come as a result of you know, and, and nobody said it and everybody's being very political about it. You know, the hate environment that was created uh, in the 2000s in, in Arizona. Uh, and hopefully, and in conclusion, uh, we can learn to live with each other on a more equal basis because the power is a little better. Uh, you know, people would say to me when I was, you know, traveling out of the state, how could you, how could Arizona do that? What's wrong with you people? And they were more pro, uh, profane words, by the way, I'm being kind right now. Uh, and, and my response was, was, they did it because they can, because they own the legislature, because they own the governorship, because they own all of the political uh, uh, power that they need to do what they want to do, irrespective of what effect it has on the Latino community. But remember, the Latino community finally said, it's not about them, the undocumented, it's about us because they are us and we are not going to sit back and allow it to happen. Adelante con la lucha. I do want to mention Annie. that a story yeah. uh, in talk in the, the, the legislative session after SB 1070 was passed, there were 23 anti-immigrant bills going through the legislature, but it took the business community and the coalition to come together to make sure that that those bills were killed and they were killed right away because they were, all the EDs of the business community came together. And I, and I asked a couple of the business uh, EDs and I said, why didn't you do this the year before when SB 1070 was going through? And they told me, one particular ED told me, because we did not think it would pass in the legislature. And, and so, and it did. And so in retrospect, it's, it's, I think we're, you're right. I think we're at a point where we do need to work across the aisle to come to with some solutions because we can't exist like this. It, it doesn't work for everybody. It, it's, it's a lose-lose for everyone. So we really need to talk about the solutions. And it starts with going back to SB 1070 and just taking out those bad pieces. But I don't think we'll ever have any anti-immigration legislation, as you said, Daniel, that will pass through this legislature unless something drastically happens. But, um, okay. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Petra. Uh, one, one last brief conclusion, uh, Daniel Gonzalez. <clears throat> Oh, Lynn, he's well, I think we should, I mean, just right. maybe, maybe just mention a little bit kind of, you know, there have been major changes in, in, at the state level after SB 1070, but at the national level, you know, we're faced, uh, the, 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 the situation has changed very dramatically from, you know, in 2006 when there was hope that comprehensive immigration reform was on the verge of passing to having a president who has 
campaigned and uh, on, on a very uh, rigid anti-immigration platform and, and has taken step after step after step to reduce and restrict not only undocumented population uh, immigration, but legal immigration. Um, in, in, uh, we've seen, you know, uh, the, the, the way, the cooperation that he has pressured with, uh, from Mexico to uh, slow and stop asylum seekers from Central America from reaching the United States. Uh, we've seen the programs like the MM, MPP program that forces asylum seekers to uh, wait in Mexico and essentially dumps them in, in border communities to, to fend for themselves while they're trying to seek asylum. And now more recently after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, the Trump administration is now summarily deporting all the asylum seekers that make it into the United States across the border they're not even giving a chance to apply for asylum. They're just being flown back. Um, and then this, this, this week, um, we saw that um, uh, using the COVID-19 as a, as a pretext, um, the, the president is now going to temporarily suspend um, uh, people from uh, seeking green cards who are trying to come to the United States. So these would be relatives of uh, US citizens and legal permanent residents uh, in the United States who are trying to bring their relatives here who are now going to uh, have to be waiting in limbo. And we're talking many times of people who have been waiting sometimes years or decades for their green card uh, uh, number to come up and now they're going to have to, to wait. So at the national level, although we've seen changes at the positive changes, I think at the state level, at the national level is, is, going to, is, is a very a different story. And I think that it's going to be interesting to see if some of the uh, changes that we saw, so the way uh, SB 1070 galvanized uh, Latino voters to the polls um, here in Arizona plays out in the 2020 presidential election. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, well, Glenn Hammer, I don't know if you want to finish your comments, <laughs> so uh, we're glad you're back. No, Mr. Council General, um, 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 I apologize for that. Thank you for having me on today. I, I just would like to say, let's. I, I look forward to working with all of you. Uh, we, we desperately do need a fix on the federal level when it comes to our immigration system. And I believe that there's a lot of constructive ways we can work together. And I look forward to doing so. And I look forward to getting to the other side of this uh, pandemic as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. I'm just going to read just the uh, brief conclusions, very, very brief. So, well, Danny Ortega, uh, he said SB 1070 was, was at a peak of a movement that has that start more than 10 years ago. Uh, Charlene, just ha she highlighted the damage in education. So we cannot, we can't, we can't put warriors for kids that want to go to college. And this connects with what Glenn said about immigrants uh, want to be educated and they are, and they are right now um, combating in the front lines uh, of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they are doctors, nurses, and more. Um, and Petra Falcón, she, she says that we need to acknowledge this, um, this uh, reality. Uh, Daniel Gonzalez uh, just calling and recognizing the key role that Latino politician, politicians are playing right now. And, I, I, I would also like to, to make a, a remark of what Charlene said about the uh, documented community being left out of these programs that are trying to uh, give some relief to, to, to the population uh, in this uh, terrible situation we are experiencing now. And it's kind of uh, paradoxical, uh, I would say paradoxical in the, in the sense that the how Homeland Security uh, department is considering uh, some agricultural workers like who were documented by like being essential for for the subsistence of of our whole population in the states, and we have also DACA students who who DACA people who are at the front lines and is helping in hospitals, being nurses, being being very very uh, very supportive in this situation. And where well, I would like just to read my. One last statement, uh, just to finish. So it is vital to remember what happened 10 years ago to make uh, sure it's not repeated. So and right now it's an excellent opportunity to do it because immigrants and undocumented immigrants are contributing in, in the front lines of this 
pandemic and well let's recognize that and thank you very much for your participation we want to serve the council as a uh, open space for this uh these exercises these reflections and thank you very much for participating thank you, thank you. Adelante. Thank you. Adelante. thank you thank you thank you thank you very much Be safe, everybody be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Yes, Bye. You Thank you. Hasta luego, Dani. Hasta luego. Bye. Bye.